Good evening. And thank you all for coming. I'm Marjorie Olmsted, and I am a certified quantum mechanic. I'm also the associate chair for undergraduate affairs at the University of Washington Department of Physics. And in that role, I am delighted to welcome you all here to our Physics Slam. I hope that you are all ready to have your minds expanded and your senses entertained. As physicists at the university, we are privileged to have what I believe is one of the absolute best jobs in the world. As a researcher and a teacher, I actually get paid to be curious and to talk to people. It's pretty cool. As a researcher, there is something really indescribable about that moment when you realize there is some secret of the universe of how it works that no one else in the universe knows except you. Now, most of the time, there are only three or four other people in the universe that actually care about that esoteric <laughs> and um, obscure little bit about the universe, but it's still exciting. And every once in a while, though, we actually discover something that would be of interest to lots of people if we can only find a way to communicate it in a way that those people will understand. And that's when that role of being a teacher comes into play. And tonight, our physics slammers will test their teaching skills to the limit by taking their front line, what most of us would normally think of as esoteric research, and make it accessible to you in 10 minutes. We're about to hear from six early career physicists and astronomers about their own personal discoveries of one of the secrets of the universe. And these secrets exist on every scale imaginable, from particles that you need at least half a million of them to weigh as much as an electron, to galaxies traveling through the cosmos. Tonight's Physics Slam, though, has two goals. One is to communicate six exciting new ideas to you, the general public, and that's what we're going to spend the next hour and a half doing. I'll get back to that. And our other goal, though, is actually already accomplished. Your contributions have raised more than $1,500 to send UW undergraduate students to meetings that celebrate and support diversity in the physics workforce. Thank you. This work is extremely important. Now, the physics community is far more diverse than when I started physics graduate school 40 years ago. But that improvement has plateaued and in some cases even reversed. The fraction of physics bachelor's degrees going to women peaked about 10 years ago, and it's actually slowly coming down. Here at the University of Washington, we are the largest undergraduate physics program in the country. We graduated 182 physics bachelors last year. <laughs> pretty cool, but only 28 of them identified as women, and only 15 identified as underrepresented minorities. That, to me, is just not acceptable. Why should it still be front page news yesterday that two women went on a spacewalk by themselves with no <laughs> men along? As the Chinese proverb says, women hold up half the sky. Likewise, why should someone's ability to follow their dream to unlock the secrets of the universe depend on the melanin content in their skin? It just doesn't make sense. At physics at UW, we welcome students of all identities and backgrounds to the pursuit of physics. However, if talented young people look around and they don't see people with whom they can identify, their first reaction is often to assume they don't belong and take those talents elsewhere. Physics cannot afford to lose that talent. These incorrect assumptions, though, can be overturned when students participate in conferences that gather people who are in the minority at their home institution and put them in an environment where for a few days they are in the majority. The benefits of experiencing a community of people who share both a similar life experience and a love of physics cannot be underestimated. These conferences promote both resilience and persistence in physics. 
So the proceeds from this slam will be used to support the travel of UW undergraduates from both Seattle and Bothell to participate in what's known as QIP, the Conference for Undergraduate Women in Physics, which some of you may have participated in our first physics slam when we hosted QIP last January. This year it will be held out at Wazoo in Pullman, and this will help support a contingent of students from UW going there. And any extra money will be put aside to help other undergraduates attend other conferences, such as those sponsored by the National Society of Black and Hispanic Physicists and the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. Thank you for enabling this important part of our educational mission. And now, before we go on, I would like to make a couple of technical announcements. One is, although we want you to have your cell phones to vote at the end, please put them on silent now. And also, I, I need to inform you that this event is being recorded. So if you come up and ask a question at the end, it will be recorded and on the web later. So I want you to just be aware of that. We want you all to ask questions, but you should know that. Now, I'm going to introduce our MCs for the evening, physics graduate students Bryn McCoy and Shervin Saba. And Shervin Saba. They organized this entire event, chose the speakers, invited them, chose the prizes, you name it, they did it. So thank you. <laughs> Shervin Saba is a physics graduate student working with an applied math professor, Nathan Kutz, on data-driven approaches to algorithmically discover and control the physics of photonic devices. What that means is he throws a lot of data into a computer, has the computer sorted into boxes, and then uses that to figure out how we can harness light to do our bidding on the scale of a few billionths of a meter. Shervin's hobbies include long walks on Wikipedia, candlelit coding <laughs> sessions, and drinking coffee on Friday night. <laughs> Bryn McCoy started her physics path as an art major. And I had the privilege of being her instructor when she was an undergraduate here 10 years ago. And there are not many students I remember from a class 10 years ago, 130 students big, okay? But when the smartest student in the class has a tattoo and pink hair and sitting right up front, you remember her. <laughs> her hair's green now, but it was pink then. <laughs> Bryn is now a graduate student at the UW Center for Experimental Nuclear Physics and Astrophysics, or CENPA, and she works on an experiment that takes place out at Fermilab in Illinois which has the really ingenious name of muon, G minus <laughs> two. What that means is they place subatomic particles called muons in a magnetic field and use their behavior, how a little parameter that you can measure differs from the number two, and they use that to test the standard model of particle physics. But so far, her attempts to use particle accelerators to become a superhero though, have become unsuccessful. <laughs> anyway, take it away, Shervin and Bryn. Thank you, Marjorie, for our introduction. And hello, welcome to the first annual Physics Slam. So I'm your host, Shervin Saba. And I'm your other host, Bryn McCoy. So Bryn, what is a physics slam? That's a really good question, Trevin. I'm glad you asked. Thank you. Tonight, six physicists will be competing to wow you with science in just 10 minutes. 10 minutes? That's right. <laughs> then we'll have a few minutes for you, the audience, to ask them questions. So be thinking about those. Then what, Trevin? Then I believe we need to vote for a winner. Um, so have your phone or internet device ready. We have Wi-Fi passwords up here, mm -hmm. uh, but if you're logged into a network, you're all set to go. Mm -hmm. What does the winner get? The winner receives the title of Slammer Supreme. <laughs> oh, yeah. Also, the winner will walk away with this Mary Curie tote bag. Mm -hmm. you have the click, click, oh, yes. click. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> with this sweet glow-in-the-dark Mary Curie tote bag. 
non-radioactive, I, mm -hmm. I, I believe, I believe, yeah. We haven't tested them, uh, so we're not really sure. Okay, cool, cool. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. And a gift card to Cafe Solstice, which is a primary provider of fuel uh, for science here at UW. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds awesome. Let's get started. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> All right. So, our first contestant is Dr. Sarah Tuttle. Sarah runs a Daisy Girl Scout troop, and she makes a pretty solid noodle kugel, I've heard. In her spare time, she studies galaxy evolution, and she builds instruments for telescopes on the ground and in space. Her favorite color is purple, which is awkward because now she's a professor at the University of Washington. <laughs> Please welcome Sarah Tuttle. All right, since I'm first, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect, good. All right, so Marjorie just set you up. We're gonna do new, exciting, cutting edge things. So I'm gonna start by time traveling us to 1672. So we're gonna learn about spectroscopy today. Maybe, if I can advance the slides. Dun, 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 we're just gonna do it, it's cool. So what I do, as Bryn mentioned, is I do astronomical instrumentation. I build the things that go behind the telescope. So in this picture, the thing behind the telescope is a person. So you could say the astronomical instrument is the eye and the brain. So your eye and your brain can be an astronomical instrument, but we also put all sorts of things there. We might put a camera that takes pictures and gives us images at different wavelengths, or we might put something called a spectrograph. So what I build are spectrographs. Yeah, we think it's cool. It's gonna work, you guys. And we think about what is that? What's a spectrograph? Now, we'd like to act like they're extremely fancy, but the truth is, these are Isaac Newton's lab notebooks. Uh, I totally just flew there and stole them from England. You'll be happy to know. They'll get them back tomorrow. And Isaac Newton did something that people had known for a while. If you use a prism and you put light through it, it splits into a rainbow. But he did some tests to try to understand, is something actually happening in the prison or are we observing a property of light? And it turns out we're observing a property of that white light when it goes through. It's like, okay, it turns out it only took something like 300 years before we really understood what we were observing. Um, yeah, right? That's exactly right. Then we got it. The 60s and the 70s happened, and it was all clear. No. Uh, so this is what's happening. We have a prism, and it's splitting it. This is visible light, although you can do this at other wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum. But it doesn't really tell you. If I say, okay, light is at different wavelengths. We go through here. How does that work in an astronomical instrument? The truth is, this is the dirty truth of my job. We still basically are just putting prisms in boxes. Here you can see the box has gotten fancier. You'll learn more about some of these pieces, including the photo detector CCDs in the next talk. But really, you know, we've gotten much better at making the things that make our rainbows. But at the end of the day, we're putting light in, we're separating it into its constituent parts, and we're reading it out with something like a computer attached to some electronics. So this is what a spectrograph looks like. Cool. But how does that work? Right, this seems odd, this is odd, it's a strange thing. And so we start to ask, how does that work? Here is the whole electromagnetic spectrum from short to long wavelengths. The visible spectrum's a little bit in the middle. I've built spectrographs that are ultraviolet and visible. We're not gonna talk too much about the details of them, but we can look and identify all these wavelengths of light. And I'll talk a little bit about why we care about that. But first I'm gonna show you spectra, because they're just beautiful. Does anyone wanna take a stab at what this is a spectrum of? Yes, we have a winner. You have no prizes, sorry. So this is a spectrum of the sun. Now we know about stars actually that they're thermal and that rainbow is what we see when an object has some temperature. We see a whole rainbow. This is a little weird though. Is this the whole rainbow? No, we're missing something. We see all these lines that we call absorption lines. So we looked at the sun, we saw the spectrum and we were like, I get how that works, wait, no, no I do not. I do not know, where did all those photons go? And the answer is, I'm gonna tell you, so when you leave here, you're gonna understand where absorption lines come from. Absorption lines and emission lines are actually a result of quantum mechanics, so we're moving forward in time here. I'm gonna bring you up to the present, I promise, and are a direct result of the quantization of energy. 
So one of the things that Albert Einstein was famous for was for understanding that photons and electrons, these packets of energy, have discrete sizes. Oh, thank you, don't worry, I got it. Uh, <laughs> have discrete packets, uh, amounts of energy they can have, and having those discrete sizes leads to some extremely exciting effects, including the fact that different materials have different fingerprints like this, so we're actually able to see what element we're looking at when we see a spectrum like this. What's super cool, this is my favorite periodic table, that's my guilt as a spectroscopist, this is the whole periodic table with all of its emission lines. One thing you might notice is their emission lines are all different. So every material has a different emission line, which is pretty spectacular. But you're still like, that's cool, Sarah, but how does that work, right? Why would this even be? And the answer is energy levels, quantized energy levels, and in fact, when we, in astronomy, when we observe spectra, we're able to learn a lot about the materials that are emitting, the materials that are absorbing, and we're able to study three different kinds of spectra. This is a continuous spectrum with dark lines. It's an absorption spectra that we see with the sun. This is called an emission spectrum, and this is a continuous spectrum. So if I have a hot source like a, therm, like a light bulb, not an LED light bulb, but a light, regular light bulb, an incandescent bulb, I'm gonna get this thermal spectrum. I am a person, I have a thermal spectrum, but it peaks in the infrared so none of you can see it. Sorry about that. But now we're gonna do a quick demonstration so we can figure out exactly what's happening to get these emission and absorption lines. So I'm gonna need something like six volunteers and anybody under the age of like 20 who wants to run around a lot at the end. Okay, yes, you're up, come. Yes, back there, come on down. Yes, ma'am, come on over. Over here, come down. Yes, you too, come on over. I need about 30 people over here. I need a, f a few more volunteers. You can do it, come on up. You've got this, you've got this. Okay, you're over there. You guys are gonna be throwers. I'm gonna take this from you, are you ready? <laughs> Hard work, okay, open that box. That's the exciting part. You're good. You guys are gonna catch things and or duck. Okay, <laughs> you're good, super good. We've got this. Okay, you might have to come closer. You can decide, you have to judge, depending on how strong you feel about your arms right now. Okay, you guys can meditate on this. I'm gonna put this away, anything could happen. So here's what's gonna happen. They are gonna throw these rainbow balls because they are a thermal source. We've got some observers over here. You are all observers. Let's do this, otherwise I'm gonna run out of time. Okay, when you, you're gonna throw balls. Green balls go to me. Okay, got it? Are you ready? Perfect, all right, let's do this, go. Uh -oh. I'm going up in energy level. Thanks. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> Don't mind me. They're really soft, I promise. One more, one more, one more. Uh -oh. Up and down. So as I'm going, one more roll, one more roll. No laughing. There's no laughing in science. Okay. I'm absorbing the energy from the photon. It's coming in. And now I'm going to emit it at you. Oh, okay, one more, one more, and then we're going to, ah! Okay. We're good. Okay, we're good. We're turning off the light. Whew. Whew. Okay, you're ready. No, you have to hold on to those. Hold on. So, what we had there, that was science. So, are you ready? Everybody that has a ball in the audience, hold it up. Oh, good job, team. Yeah, oh, look, I got all the way back there. What color are those balls? Green. green. They're all green. Now, look over there. We had some misses, but what color are most of those balls? Not green. Not green. Excellent. <laughs> so what you have here, if you look, here's our thermal source. Can we give them a hand? Good job, thermal source. <laughs> so they're emitting all of the colors of the rainbow. But I'm over here, a cool gas. And every time a photon that is green hits me, then I hold on to it for a little bit. When I decide, you know, from statistics and stuff, I re-emit it in some direction, very rarely in this direction. Over here, all the rest of the photons are passing through. So in this way, although in fact, no nothing has just one energy level, I just wasn't gonna climb a ladder for you people, I'm so sorry. It's a volunteer gig, you know. <laughs> However, you can see, you are the observers who are seeing this bright line, this emission spectrum. Over here, they're seeing 
a continuous spectrum that's being absorbed. So they're seeing like you would see from the sun. And what's extra cool about this is it actually teaches us something about stars. So it turns out that stars, big hot things in the sky, are not just big hot things in the sky. They have a cooler gas around them called the photosphere. And that cooler gas, like I was, is what cause, causes these black absorption lines. If you guys want to sit down, I don't want you to get too tired. It's OK. We'll clean up the balls later. It's fine. Thank you so much for your help. Can we give them another hand? So with spectroscopy, we're finally suddenly able to really understand some of the physics of the materials that we're looking at. So here we can do things like look at all different temperature stars, from hot O stars all the way down to these cooler M stars. We're able to look at galaxies. These are spectra of galaxies. This is a star-forming galaxy. This is a non-star-forming galaxy. We know what these elements are, and we're able to do things like measure their abundances and the motion in the galaxy. And I've worked on projects all the way from Apache Point in New Mexico, where we are using these for galaxies and stars. I built a spectrograph in the ultraviolet that flew into almost space on a NASA balloon to measure the intergalactic medium. Uh, and this is a spectrograph that I built called HETDEX. Well, it's called Virus, but the project is HETDEX, which is measuring dark energy in Texas. I mean, the dark energy is in the universe, but the instrument itself is in Texas, obviously. So this is the entire history of the universe. So you can see this is obviously, although hundreds of years old, one of the most important tools that we have with us today. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to have them on, and while you do that, I'm going to pick up a few balls so nobody dies. Thank you, Dr. Toto. Let's thank her one more time. So our next slammer will be Dr. Patam Mitra. Patam is from Canada. He had a dream to be a pilot, but that dream changed. He is now a physicist. Uh, Patam works as a postdoc at the Center for Experimental Nuclear Physics and Astrophysics. Other than looking for dark matter, he's also part of a dance troupe that performs in and around the city. Let's give him a round of applause. So Sarah here took you on a journey to see the visible part of the universe. I would like to take you on a journey to see the dark side of the universe. So we're going to look at searching for dark matter in the universe. So our story begins in 1931 with a man, with a brilliant man who you probably have never heard about before. His name was Fritz Zwicky. He was born in Dresden. If you look up at the night sky, um, you might be able to identify this constellation called Coma. Uh, Zwicky was looking at that cluster. If you look at it with a telescope, you'll see a picture like this. I have taken that picture and I have circled all the galaxies that you could see in that picture. Remember, each and every green circle here has four billion suns. Anyways, this has a lot of mass, so these galaxies do go around each other. The genius of Zwicky was to actually uh, identify that motion and then calculate how much of the stuff shines and how much of it actually hides in the dark. <laughs> the conclusion was there's a lot of material that actually hides in the dark. In fact, that's, uh, that's what our universe is mostly made of. Um, and we are the exception. He coined the term dark matter that stuck around. We see this again in 1971 with Vera Rubin in our own galaxy. Expected? Observed. And every other galaxy we've ever observed, it turns out there's 30 times, 30 times more material that hides in the dark than what actually shines. So if you have ever, had, ever read a textbook in your school that says that the universe is made up of protons, electrons, and all these subatomic particles, you realize that that's all wrong. The universe is mostly made up of stuff that we have no clue about. <laughs> so when I say this to my neighbors and my parents, they're like, well, you can't leave us there. Like, you, you need to tell us what it is, right? <laughs> so, so how do we see it? And uh, well, uh, I, I, I work for an experiment uh, that we are trying to take a picture. Uh, so, uh, so we will build a camera to try to detect dark matter. No, we're literally going to take a camera and improve it to try to, see, uh, try to see dark matter. But what are we looking for? 
So we are looking for a yet unknown particle that rarely interacts with ordinary matter. This is where theorists come in, and that's the most favorite theory at the moment. So let's take the camera, and uh, let's go through with how the camera works, and then let's improve it to try to detect dark matter with it. So normally, um, we have a little uh, piece of silicon, in, uh, in, like the camera is made of silicon. We call these little units uh, pixels. They have an arrangement of silicon atoms and electrons. Uh, we have either a particle or we have a photon light that comes in and interacts with the silicon and uh, the silicon atoms or electrons might recoil off of, off of them. Uh, the interaction is the same for, pro, uh, for photons as it is for particles. What happens after that is that the recoiling uh, silicon nucleus cr creates electron hole pairs and we can measure how many electron hole pairs we have made and then when we do this, we can uh, reconstruct an image pixel by pixel. This is how your camera works. This is how your cell phone camera works as well. So let's zoom out a bit. So that's the camera. That's the camera sensor. Um, and I have laid out uh, the pixels here for you. This is called a pixel array. Uh, between each rows, we have an insulator called a channel stop uh, that prevents all the electrons that you have generated from moving in this direction. Using electric fields, we move the electrons all the way to the side. We call this special rows of uh, silicon a serial register. And then we read how many electrons we have collected, pixel by pixel, to construct uh, an image. So, so this is how, this is how uh, CCD sensors work. So once you, once you have uh, the number of electrons that you have, I mean, once you have the electrons in the uh, amplifier, how we count them is we first put them in a special part of the device called the summing well. Um, and uh, when we are ready to count them, we put them in a place called the sense node where we sense the number of electrons we have generated. And once we have counted how many electrons we uh, had, we put them in the drain where they just go away. <laughs> and this works very well in, uh, when you want to take a picture of, uh, of say, like the outside. Uh, uh, that's because like, the, uh, the, like your sensor is only accurate to about 15 electrons. What that means is that if you measure 100 electrons, it can be anywhere from 85 to 100, 115. That's okay for taking normal pictures because you have thousands of electrons that you collect. But if you're looking for dark matter, you might want to read single electrons, like one or two electrons that you might collect in each, each pixel. So we will have to make some modifications uh, to make this camera go there and be one of the most sensitive cameras ever built. So I take my magic wand and I am going to drop two uh, pieces of silicon. What this will allow us to do something very special, observe. Oh wait, what's happening? You see, the electrons can actually be like put in the sense node. You can measure how many you had, and then you can actually move them back into the summing well and perform this measurement over and over again many times, 100, maybe 1,000 times. We do it 2,500 times. Each time you measure them, your accuracy gets better and better and better until you get to see single electrons. Again, once you're done, you're satisfied with your measurements. Um, you just move the electrons out, and they go off the drain. What does this look in practice? So this is a picture taken with one of our CCDs. If you were to take your cell phone camera and cool it down, you'll also see a similar picture. Um, these are particles that, that are radioactive particles that are around, and they just go through the sensor, and you can take pictures of them. Let's zoom in into an area, that area. It looks pretty blank. There's almost, there's like nothing there, nothing interesting. If you zoom in, you see noise. But now, let's actually start to make many, many measurements and see what comes up. 10 measurements, you don't see anything. 50, you still don't see anything. 100, hmm. You start to see hidden hit things that were, that were not visible before. 500 measurements, 800, 900. You see these are also particle tracks. This had four electrons, this had seven. You could not see them before. But with the modified camera, now you can. They have come to light for you. So 
This is how we have built the most sensitive camera that was ever built, most sensitive CCD that was ever built. And we are actually ready to look for dark matter with this uh, device. But it's not only dark matter. We can use these devices in astronomy. So Sarah, you can use this for b taking better pictures of the night sky. It, there, there's a proposal to use them for quantum sensing and quantum information sciences. You can use these devices for any application that needs a better camera. With that, I'd like to conclude. So when you leave uh, the, uh, the talks this evening and you look at the night sky, do wonder, uh, wonder for a moment. And, and uh, remember that it's not what shines in the night sky, but what hides in the dark that holds the true secrets of our cosmos. All right, thanks so much, Dr. Mitra. So our next contestant is Dr. Mike Wong. Mike is a postdoc in the University of Washington's Department of Astronomy and Astrobiology program. He's the host of Strange New Worlds, a science and Star Trek podcast. Since he's used to being on the radio, he's not quite sure how he feels about the audience staring at him while he speaks. So. Feel free to close your eyes for the next 10 minutes while you enjoy your trip to the outer solar system. Please welcome Dr. Wong. Welcome to Jupiter, king of the planets, master of mysteries beneath its clouds. I'd like to introduce you to two mysteries about Jupiter today. The first is that we don't actually know what makes Jupiter look red. It's true, we actually don't have a positive identification of the molecule or chromophore that gives Jupiter its red color. The second mystery is one of a case of missing ammonia, or NH3. You see, we have a spacecraft in orbit of Jupiter right now. Its name is Juno. And it's able to sense the chemical abundances of Jupiter's atmosphere beneath its clouds. And it's discovered that there is a region of Jupiter's atmosphere with only half as much ammonia as there should be. So this is what we do know about Jupiter's atmosphere. It's a plot with temperature on the horizontal axis and altitude on the vertical. You can see Jupiter's thermal profile in this charismatic blue line and the various exotic cloud and haze layers. The region of Jupiter's atmosphere that interests me the most is this one right here, where water vapor is condensing into water clouds. This region is habitable, at least by the metrics of temperature, pressure, and water content. It's also the region in which Jupiter's mysterious red chromophores might reside, and the region of that unexplained lack of ammonia. When I heard this, my mind started twirling. I started wondering, could there be an astrobiological explanation for what we're seeing? In other words, could there be life on Jupiter? Well, I've never met a Jovian life form, but I have met myself, and I do know what I do. I eat and I breathe. I take electrons from the electron-rich food that I eat and transfer them to the electron-greedy oxygen in the air that I breathe. And it's that electron transfer that powers me to be able to stand up here and slam some physics with you all. <laughs> now, if the transfer of electrons to gain energy is sounding kind of weird to you, I guarantee it's not a strange phenomenon at all. It's exactly what happens when you light a piece of wood on fire or flip a switch to light the room. So it can be said in general what life does is life completes a geochemical circuit between some environmental reductant or electron source and some environmental oxidant or electron sink. So in our hypothetical scenario for a life form on Jupiter, let us consider an organism that is consuming ammonia as its food source. The next logical question is what is it breathing? What is its oxidant? Well, there's not a lot of free oxygen around on Jupiter. So my first guess was maybe we should try sulfur, in particular polysulfur, or S8, which I know you can make from an interaction between H2S, or hydrogen sulfide, and ultraviolet light. 
But the more I thought about polysulfur, the more it became troubling to me, because you want your oxidant down here in Jupiter's habitable region, but down there, not a lot of UV light is available. Most of it gets scattered away by the top of Jupiter's atmosphere. So maybe can you make your polysulfur somewhere else and mix it downwards? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is no, because where there is available UV light, there's not a lot of H2S. And that's because the sulfur compounds in Jupiter's atmosphere condense into these ammonium hydrosulfide clouds. So without an oxidant, I almost gave up thinking about life on Jupiter until I realized that the same calculation that told me that not a lot of ultraviolet light gets down here tells me that a lot of visible light does. And you know what life on Earth has decided to do with visible light? It's developed and evolved photosynthetic apparatuses. These are things that are able to take multiple photons of visible light and split apart molecules like H2O or H2S. And why does life do this on Earth? To make its own source of food or reductant in the form of hydrogen. But on Jupiter, hydrogen is everywhere. You don't need to make your own hydrogen. What you need is a source of oxidant. So I propose that if life were to evolve on a world like Jupiter, it would do something that I call inverse phototrophy which is doing the exact same splitting of H2O or H2S with repeated hits of visible photons, but so that it can harvest the oxidants that it's creating, in this case, O2 or S2. So a hypothetical metabolism on Jupiter could look like this. A life form that consumes ammonia as its reductant or food source, and then transfers those electrons to the oxygen or the sulfur that it is creating itself by inverse phototrophy, splitting apart H2O or H2S. And whether you use oxygen or sulfur gives you a different amount of energy for your metabolism. Now, it's very interesting to note that here on Earth, we know of photosynthetic pigments that absorb in the purple, blue, and green wavelengths and leave the warmer colors completely alone. We call these photopigments carotenoids. They're the reason why carrots look orange and tomatoes look red. So we can modify our thought experiment here to consider Jovian life forms that are performing inverse phototrophy by absorbing light in the way that carotenoid photopigments do. Now, we're almost ready to put everything together and start throwing numbers into our equations. But first, we need one last piece of information. And that is, what does a Jupiter life form look like? So life on Earth is made of cells, which are basically bags of mostly water. Such a cell would sink like a rock in Jupiter's mostly hydrogen helium atmosphere. And remember, Jupiter is a gas giant. There's nothing to land on. It will just keep falling and falling and falling until it reaches a part of the atmosphere that is too hot. It will essentially incinerate. We call that the pyrolytic depth. So people have hypothesized that if life were to be, uh, evolve on Jupiter, it would have a different morphology. It would look instead more like a balloon or a bubble and float majestically through the atmosphere, slowly sinking to that pyrolytic depth on the time scale of about a month. And that is the time scale in which it has to replicate itself so that its progeny can catch random thermal plumes and stay aloft in the habitable region. OK, now we're ready to put everything together and throw numbers at this. OK, so the first thing we do is we calculate the flux of photons that are photosynthetically available at the habitable depth of Jupiter. Then we take that flux of photons and we convert that into a biomass synthesis rate for these organisms. And then we can take this biomass synthesis rate and calculate a number, column number density of such photosynthetic shell-shaped organisms, balloon-like organisms that are floating in Jupiter's atmosphere. Now, these numbers are you know, pretty nasty, kind of ugly. Don't pay attention to them. They're just there to show you the steps I'm taking to get the, this last set of numbers that I want you to take away. And that is the optical depth of blue light that is caused by these organisms absorbing in carotenoid-like wavelengths. Optical depth is just fancy physics speak for how much light is absorbed. When the optical depth reaches one or greater, that means that most of the light has been absorbed. So when I report optical depths of blue light of 5.4 or 1.6, that means that these organisms are actually absorbing most of the blue light in Jupiter's atmosphere. 
Thus, they could represent the mysterious unknown red chromophores that make Jupiter look red. So that's a story. A story that uses inverse phototrophic carrot-colored balloon-like organisms to explain Jupiter's apparent redness and lack of ammonia. But it's just a story. I'm not saying that there is definitely life on Jupiter. So don't go running out of this auditorium screaming that Mike Wong thinks that there's life on Jupiter because <laughs> I didn't do this calculation to prove life on Jupiter. I did it to expand our minds to uncharted possibilities of existence. You see, life out there must obey the same laws of physics that life here on Earth does. But those laws may permit an infinitude of diversity in which Earth life is just a single shade of razzmatazz in a grand cosmic rainbow of creation. Now, a lot of people ask me, Mike, why are you so worried about aliens? <laughs> when there are so many other problems that we need to fix here on Earth first. My answer to that is that the search for extraterrestrial life can actually help us heal our fractured world. Because that search demands of us that we take a cosmic perspective. A perspective in which our planet is but a fragile pale blue dot. A perspective in which we, we human beings, are all far more similar to one another than we are different. It's the same letters in our DNA, the same stardust in our blood, the same need for energy, for electrons, for light. When we look up at the night sky and wonder, are we alone? We come to discover that in each other, together as earthlings, we are not. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Our next contestant is Dr. Chelsea Bartram. Chelsea is a physics postdoc at the Center for Experimental Physics and Nuclear. A hmm. Let me get that right. The Center for Experimental Nuclear Physics and Astrophysics. Got it. Senpa, C E N P A. Uh, she loves working with radio frequency electronics, and her work has parallels to her hobbies of amateur radio and playing the flute. And if you stay tuned, you'll see what we mean. Let's welcome Chelsea. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? <laughs> The suspense is building. OK. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to give my talk today titled Searching for Dark Matter Axions with ADMX. Um, as they said, my name is Chelsea Bartram. I work at SEMPA, which is a lab on UW's campus. And I'll be explaining ADMX, which stands for Axion Dark Matter Experiment. So luckily, Patam already gave a wonderful introduction to dark matter. Just a quick review. What is dark matter? Well, it's a form of matter that is out there. And um, we know that it uh, makes up 85% of the matter budget of the universe. Um, but we don't know what it is. So there is a lot of ideas. And I'm here today to explain one of those ideas called the axion. So what are axions then? Well, they're a potential dark matter candidate. And it solves two problems at once, which is really lucky. So the first problem is, what is dark matter? And then they also happen to explain a phenomenon in nuclear physics, which is, is that we see uh, no such thing as a neutron electric dipole moment. So you can think of this as like a charge distribution for uh, the neutron uh, particle. So axions, as it turns out, if they exist, they decay to a photon that is a light particle in a magnetic field. So what do we need to detect them then? Well, we need a magnetic field. Um, and then we need what's called a microwave cavity. 
and very low background noise. And what this translates to is your experiment has to be very cold. So why do we need a microwave cavity? Well, you may be familiar with the idea of oscillating systems, which have a resonance frequency. You can think of a playground swing, or you can think of a guitar string, for example. Um, the resonant frequency of a swing is the unpushed uh, swing frequency, and with a guitar string, it's the pitch. Um, if you push a swing at its resonant frequency, you'll get maximal energy transfer. And you can think of this uh, with regard to our microwave cavity, um, insofar as if we tune our cavity to match the resonant frequency of the photon or light particle, then we can enhance our ability to detect it. And so this touches on a topic that is near and dear to my heart because uh, I am also a musician and the concept of resonant cavities is very familiar to musicians. So I've made a table here of the similarities and differences between my favorite resonant cavity, the flute, and microwave cavities. So the microwave cavity is an electromagnetic cavity. The flute is acoustic. Um, the resonant frequency of both of these scales with size. So if you're familiar with an orchestra, the piccolo has the highest frequency pitch, and then you go down to the tuba and it's the lowest frequency. A microwave cavity um, can be tuned via something called tuning rods. So you're changing the geometry of your cavity. And a flute, you tune via keys and the airstream. So when you press keys down, you effectively make the flute longer and um, you make the pitch lower. So let's just do a test. So there's just a higher note with one key. That's a lower note, right? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so an axion haloscope then is our detector. And um, we have an axion come in, interact in the magnetic field, and uh, turn into a photon. The photon is then picked up by our microwave cavity. Um, and we tune it continuously, and that's because we don't know a priori what the frequency of that photon is going to be, because we don't know uh, the mass of the axion. They're related. Um, and so we tune the detector, and the analog of that with the flute is just a chromatic scale. So you're tuning, and um, it, each of the notes, as I'm stepping down, corresponds to um, each of our steps with our tuning rod. And then we uh, read out the power coming from the cavity, and um, if you see an excess in the power, so that's like a, a note on the flute that's much louder, you've found the axion, so good job. Uh, so this is also similar to tuning an AM radio. Um, just to give you an idea, here's the power and here's frequency, and as you tune it, you see these resonant peaks kind of move along in frequency, right? Okay, so I also said our experiment needs to be very cold, but just how cold is cold? Well, it turns out the, um, the temperature of interstellar space is something around two Kelvin, which if you're more familiar with Fahrenheit corresponds to something like minus 455 degrees. Um, our experiment gets down to 90 millikelvin, so that's very cold, minus 259.5 degrees. Um, I would like to warn you, uh, so we use a, something called a dilution refrigerator to achieve this, um, these cold temperatures, but I would not attempt such a thing with a dilution refrigerator. Icicles are dangerous enough. So, <laughs> so just to review, here are a few key components of ADMX. So we need a very strong magnet, so we use what's called a superconducting magnet, which has a magnetic field of 8 tesla. So that's actually really big. It seems like a small number, but Earth's magnetic field is something like 0.000025 tesla. Um, and then we need our microwave cavity and electronics. So here you can see um, the microwave cavity sitting here. Um, it goes into the borehole of the magnet, and there's the uh, very fancy thing called a dilution refrigerator, which cools all of that down, and that's kind of sitting in here. So here is a picture of the, uh, what we call the insert or the cavity and all of its instrumentation um, ready to go into the magnet bore. And here's an example of uh, two happy researchers working on <laughs> science. <laughs> and so I want to emphasize that we are an extremely sensitive experiment. 
um, so sensitive that we can detect yoctowatts of power. This is uh, 10, uh, with, uh, 10 to the minus 24, so that's 24 zeros. That's really small. Um, this is equivalent to if you went on Mars, you had a cell phone, you would get about four bars of signal. So that's really good. Uh, in fact, if you were Mark, Wa Mark Watney from The Martian, and you're really good at hacking things, you might want to try building an 80 meg style cell phone and just call NASA. Uh, it wouldn't help with the time lag, but you'd get a good signal. <laughs> All right, and so this is what the detector looks like. Uh, here we are um, pulling it out of the insert. You'll see all of the cold gases um, as it pulls out. And there it goes. You can get a sense of the scale of this thing. Um, it's a bit like the monolith from 2001, A Space Odyssey. So. <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. It's a long process. <laughs> there it goes. Okay, so if the axion were discovered, um, there's a few uh, facts I'd like to uh, explain. So uh, the particle has an associated wavelength, or every particle has an associated wavelength, and axions in particular, they would have a very long wavelength. Um, so there's this company that makes these particle uh, bean bags, which is really handy, but if they make one for the axion, we would need a much longer plushie. So uh, I'm waiting for them to figure out what this dark matter beanbag is, and I really hope it's the axion. Sorry, Patam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, in conclusion, ADMX has implemented new technologies in its latest dark matter searches. Uh, we're taking data to search for axion dark matter with unparalleled se sensitivity. Uh, stay tuned, haha, -ha, for more updates in the future. And here's a panoramic of our lab. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thanks, Dr. Bartram. That was awesome. Our next contestant is Dr. Menglei Sun. Uh, Menglei was born in the inner province of um, inner Mongolia province of China. One day, when she was a high school student, she suddenly wondered what's inside an electron. So she decided to study particle physics, of course. <laughs> now she's a postdoc at the Center for Experimental Nuclear Physics and Astrophysics and is working on the Katrin experiment to measure the neutrino mass. In her spare time, she likes writing songs. Please welcome Dr. Soon. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, I will start. So um, as introduced, I, I just wonder what's inside of a electron. And it turns out that there's nothing. There's no inner structures inside a electron because the electron is a fundamental particle, and the fundamental particles made up of our universe. So just similar to the electrons, we have a bunch of the uh, fundamental particles. So um, these 18 fundamental particles are what our universe is built on. So next to the electrons, we have a similar particle called the neutrinos. The neutrino is very similar to the electrons. So they are both fermions. The difference is that electron carries a electric charge, but the neutrinos don't. So what that means is that if you put a electric potential here, you won't stop the neutrinos. You cannot trap that particles. And also, these neutrinos doesn't interact with uh, matters. So uh, literally, we have the neutrinos everywhere. So the neutrinos can be produced in the sun, they can be produced uh, in our atmosphere, and also inside our body. This is because we eat and drink every day, and the thing we eat contains some um, natural radioactive materials. So uh, it turns out that every day you produce around uh, several hundred millions of neutrinos just inside your body. So at this moment, Almost every second, a uh, hundred trillions of neutrinos pass through your body. 
you don't feel it, but they are there. Uh, they don't uh, just uh, pass through your body, they can also pass through several, uh, the Earth several thousands of times without interacting with any matter. So that's why uh, sometimes we call the neutrino the ghost particles. So this feature of the neutrinos make them very difficult to detect because they just, uh, you don't feel it. Um, so not, not just uh, uh, weight inter interacting, the neutrino is also very uh, light. So this is a typical model we show for an atom. So the smaller the things go around the nuclei are the electrons. But come to the small electrons, the neutrino are even light. So it, it turns out that the neutrino mass is much, much smaller than the electron mass. So our best, uh, the current best knowledge of the neutrino mass is below 2.0 2 uh, EV. But why does that matter? Why do we need to know the neutrino mass? This is because neutrino is the second most abundant particles in our universe. Even though they are very light, there are a lot of them, and they go through the gravitational effect. So actually, the neutrinos plays a very important role in the formation of the large scale st structures in our universe. So know the neutrino mass will help us understand better of our universe. Also, the standard model of the particle physics tell us that the neutrino mass should be zero, but it is not zero. So get the absolute value of, of the neutrino mass will help us understand uh, what is the physics beyond the standard model. So how do we get the mass since we don't detect the, the neutrinos? The answer is we detect the electrons. So we do that through this beta decay process. Uh, the, the beta decay is that you have a uh, neutrons here, it decays, gives three particles in the final state. That three final state is one, uh, one is the proton, it emits a electron plus a neutrino in the final state. So this process contains a certain energy. That energy will be shared by the three particles in the final state. So I want to illustrate this process, use a example of the pizza. Let's say that you are the electron. You and your roommate somehow live with a ghost together in your apartment. <laughs> and one day you bought a pizza and want to share with each other. Since the ghost doesn't eat, you don't necessarily need to give him a piece of pizza. So uh, with agreement with your roommate, you share the pizza and you get a, a large piece of the pizza. Uh, so this is similar to the zero mass case of the neutrino. Let's say you don't with, uh, live with a ghost. Instead, you live with a small kid. <laughs> so this time, you have to give the kid a small piece of pizza. Even small, you still need to give it him. So in that case, you need to share some of your pizza with the kid. You don't, uh, then you get less pizza. So this is what happens for the electrons. So when the neutrino carries a mass, your electrons will get less energy in the final state. So let's trans trans uh, lay that into the spectrum. This is the energy spectrum of your electrons. The interesting physics lives in the very high tail of the spectrum. So if we zoom in, the blue line shows the case of the uh, zero neutrino mass case. And if your neutrino mass is not zero, the whole spectrum will be shifted a little bit. So by detecting the spectrum, we will determine the neutrino mass. This is our experimental uh, facility. So on, uh, let's start from this side. We eject our radioactive source through this source and transportation sections. The decay will happen here. Then your final state electrons will be transported to our main spectrometer. Here, we will filter out the low energetic ones and only take the uh, uh, high, energetic, high energetic ones. Then those electrons uh, arriving in the final state will be detected by our detector, which is just a um, camera. So this is what happened in the spectrometer. 
So we have a strong uh, magnetic field in the spectrometer that will guide your electrons from one side through the other side. Then we set a very high uh, electric potential in the middle that will block all the low energetic electrons. So the high energy ones will go to the other part and the low energy ones will go back to your source. So I see this as a roller coaster. So uh, you eject your card from this side, it goes through some pre-selections, go uh, transport to the other side, then it starts to climb the hill, like here. Then if your card is uh, fast enough, you can climb the hill, re-accelerate to the other side. Otherwise, it has to uh, go back. So here, I want to show a, read, uh, a video of our uh, experiment. So here is the source part of the, our uh, apparatus. Now you have the electrons go to this side. Those ones go back, are the low energetic ones, and only a few high energy ones will go to the final end and of the um, spectrometer. Yeah, so you see uh, the ones go to the uh, final destination is only a very, very small fraction of, of the electrons we have. So this is what our spectrometer looks like. Uh, it's huge. We transport it through the small town of the Kaohsiung and people are looking around from their windows. So this thing is built in the diagonal uh, of, uh, in Germany uh, since it's not easy to transport it on land. So we take it on, on a ship and go through the Black Sea, uh, go around Italy, <laughs> go to the ocean, then finally arrive in Kaohsiung. So I'm a little a bit jealous of our vessel because this really sounds like a dreaming cruise vacation. <laughs> so why we need Kaohsiung? because it, ha it has this special facility, the laboratory. They can handle a large amount of treatments and that allow us to have the statistics we need. So after many years of construction, we finally started the experiment last year. Then we take some data for around four weeks, only four weeks, and uh, we analyze the data and that, uh, that already allow us to improve the, our knowledge of the neutrino mass. So our current uh, new upper limit on the neutrino mass has been improved to 1.1 EV. But this experiment will continue to go on for uh, several years. If you're interested, you're welcome to join us. <laughs> uh, so then this is the um, result we, we have. So thank you everyone. This is our collaboration. Wow. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Soon. So our final slammer for the evening is Dr. Matt Yankowitz. Matt is an assistant professor with a joint appointment in physics and in material science and engineering. Um, He's interested in building materials and electronics that live in two dimensions, or that are two-dimensional. Although people are <clears throat> always trying to think big, in Matt's world, it's quite better to think small. Thank you. Let's welcome Matt. All right, thank you. I'd like to tell you a bit today about what's new and exciting and small, and in particular, my research on materials that are flat, twisted, and have even a touch of magic. OK, so what is small, and why should you care about it? Well, small is all around you. Take the phone that you have in your pocket. If you look inside this, there's a processor. And inside the processor, there's a gigantic array of transistors. The transistor is a basic building block of all of modern electronics. It's basically an electrical switch. Either electrical current can or cannot pass through the transistor. And if I look very, very closely here, we find that there's a whole network of transistors. I'm, highlight I'm highlighting just a single transistor. and. There's actually 10 billion of these transistors within a single one of these processors sitting in the phone in your pocket. So small is very important. It's really driving all of our modern world. OK, so how do we get small? Well, the thing that we can do or the thing that we have done is take things that are pretty big. So the first silicon transistor is something that could fit comfortably in the palm of your hand, invented in the 1940s. And we just shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink 
until we get to what we have today. And if we take a very powerful microscope and look at our modern transistors, we'll find that they're fundamentally the same as the first transistors. They're just a heck of a lot smaller. The challenge here is that we're quickly nearing the fundamental limits of smallness. We're getting to the atomic scale. It's difficult to shrink more. And also, we're just fundamentally limited in the type of things that we can do with these types of materials. So luckily, there's been a new paradigm in small that's emerged in the past 15 years or so. And this is with the advent of materials that exist in just two spatial dimensions. So the third spatial dimension is essentially not, is, is absent in these materials. And the first one that was discovered is something called graphene. You may have heard of it. It's just a hexagonally bonded sheet of carbon atoms. And for the rest of this talk, I want to tell you that in physics, often less is more, or at least less is different. So the physics of materials in two dimensions can be profoundly different than what we typically experience in three-dimensional materials. OK, so what are the ingredients that we need to enter a flatland? We can start with a source material, like a piece of graphite, which you'd find in, in pencil lead. And then we have one magic ingredient that is a key tool that helped uh, two physicists win the Nobel Prize in physics in 2010 for the isolation of graphene. So I'll pull back the current and expose this, this key tool, and you'll find that it is literally just scotch tape. <laughs> OK, and this is not a joke. Uh, any self-respecting uh, physics lab that's looking to, to make measurements of two-dimensional materials must have drawers and drawers full of scotch tape that you can go to the any corner store and buy. And the reason that we use this, even though it seems pretty low tech, is that it's a pretty good tool for exfoliating graphene down to a single, or exfoliating graphite down to a single sheet of, of carbon atoms. So we basically put our source material or graphite on the scotch tape, and we fold it and we rip it and we fold it and we rip, and we rip it over and over. And we're essentially just cleaving layers of hexagonally bonded carbon atoms off of this bulk sheet of graphite. And then we can put the tape down on a substrate and peel it away, and with some statistical probability, we're left with just single sheets of carbon atoms, which I'm pointing out here as a slightly different contrast, which is known as graphene. And uh, graphene is very small, as you, as you could imagine. I'm overlaying a microscope image of a human hair, and this is how big it is compared to the graphene. Graphene is also very thin. It's just one atom thick of carbon atoms. All right, but graphene is not alone. Just as you can go to the zoo and find a whole uh, family of different animals, uh, we have a whole family of different materials which we can isolate down to just two dimensions, just a single atomic sheet. And in the same way that the penguin is different from the elephant, these materials are all clearly distinct from one another. And we can categorize these materials by how electricity flows and arranges itself. So we have a whole range of properties that we can find in materials that have just two spatial dimensions, from standard things that we might interact with on a daily basis, like a metal which conducts electricity, to insulators which don't, to semiconductors which are somewhat of a hybrid between the two, and to even more exotic things that are really interesting to physicists at, at very low temperatures. All right. But the real explosion of interest in this field came with a revolutionary idea about a decade ago. And actually, this was predicted in uh, the early 70s by uh, the British sketch comedy show Monty Python. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the tape and, and see what they came up with. Uh, gentlemen, a pray silence for the president mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. Royal Society mm -hmm. for putting things on top of other things. <laughs> I thank you, gentlemen. The year? has been a good one for the society. Yeah, 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 yeah. This year, our members have put more things on top of other things than ever before. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I should warn you, this is no time for complacency. No. There are still many things, and I cannot emphasize this too strongly, not on top of other things. Yeah, 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 yeah. I myself, on my way here this evening, saw a thing that was not on top of another thing in any way. Shame. 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 Shame indeed. But we must not allow ourselves to become too despondent. For we must OK. So unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I'm not a member of this society, but I think spiritually I am. The last 10 years of my research have been dedicated to putting things on other things 2D style. So here's an artist's rendering of different materials, and we can simply stack them on top of one another to create a structure of, or a heterostructure of these different two-dimensional materials. We're going from two dimensions almost back to three dimensions, but, but this is a useful thing to do. Uh, here's another example of different materials, different ordering. Another, 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 another. With all the materials we have at our disposal, there's eff effectively an infinite set of ways that we can stack these materials to create these types of structures. 
And when we do this in real life, I think what we end up with is something at the intersection of science and art. So this is a, a microscope image of a, different, of a set of different uh, flakes of two-dimensional materials that I've stacked on top of each other. And this really allows us to do whatever we want, whatever type of device that we want to create, whatever structure of materials, we can simply go in the lab and stack them up on top of each other by just putting them one by one. OK, so uh, when we make these types of structures, with apologies to anyone who's mathematically minded, we end up in a scenario where I'll argue that 1 plus 1 effectively does not equal 2. OK, so what do I mean by that? I'll start with an analogy of things that are, that are near and dear to our heart, uh, lunch. So one way to eat lunch is to squirt ketchup into your mouth and then take a bite of lettuce and then eat a piece of cheese and so on and so forth. But I think we can agree that would be a pretty disgusting way to do things. The, the better way is to stack these, these ingredients into a sandwich. OK, and in this case, this, the hamburger is made up of the same ingredients that I have on the left here. However, it tastes different than the sum of its parts. It's a new thing, right? So in the same way, we have all of these different materials, which we can isolate one by one. But when we stack them on top of each other, what we get is completely different. OK, but there's more. When we have these crystals, they have some sort of symmetry. Typically, they have uh, bonds of, of atoms in, into a hexagonal shape. And if we put one material, say graphene, onto another, boron nitride, we see that there's this emergent uh, super lattice which forms simply due to a geometric interference pattern between the two hexagonal crystals. And when I rotate these on top of each other, this so-called moray pattern changes in wavelength. You can see if you're not too disoriented that the, the pattern grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks. Okay, and again, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very nice, right? Yeah. And again, even though these are the same materials stacked on top of each other, this material at this twist angle does not behave the same way as this material at this twist angle. So we can change the properties of these materials as we want simply by changing which way that we twist them with respect to one another. And this isn't just science fiction. This is a, an atomic scale microscope image that I took about eight years ago where we can see these small hexagons uh, arising due to the hexagonally bonded carbon atoms in the graphene lattice. And then this larger hexagonal superstructure, which is owing to the geometric interference pattern between the graphene and the boron nitride lattices. All right, so I promised a bit of magic in the intro of my talk. Uh, I want to tell you a bit about one of the most exciting materials which has just emerged in the past year or so, and this is called magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. Okay, so it's not this type of magic. What we mean is that there's a very, very specific twist angle, or a magic twist angle, by which we can take two regular sheets of graphene, stack them on top of each other, and get very exotic properties out of the composite material. So we have to stack them at precisely 1.1 degrees. 1.5 is no good, 0.9 is no good, so this is kind of challenging. But if we can hit this magic angle, recall that I told you that there's a whole range of electronic properties that we can get by isolating different materials. Well, it turns out at the magic angle, with just two sheets of graphene, we can get all of these electronic properties in one material. And we can tune between them simply by changing the number of electrons or the number of charge carriers that we have in the structure. So this is really exciting and a really powerful material to study. All right, so if you've taken anything away from this talk, I want to say that there's new, material, uh, there's new physics that you can get simply by changing the number of dimensions that your materials have. All right, so in three dimensions, we could take a simple block of steel and a block of wood, and we can stack, and we can twist, but what we end up with is not very interesting. It's just a piece of steel on a piece of wood. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing new. But in two dimensions, we can get fundamentally new things. We can take two sheets of graphene. In two dimensions, the entire sheet of graphene is interfacial. I, when I stack these two things, they interact strongly, and I twist them, and I get a composite material that's completely distinct from, from any of its ingredients or any of its constituent parts. OK, so with that, I'd like to wrap up, and thank you. All right, thanks again, Dr. Yankowitz. And let's thank all of our slammers one more time. Yeah, so all of our volunteers, we'd like to ask you to set up for audience questions. So it's that time. And everyone in the audience, we're going to have microphones on either side. If you have any burning questions, please line up at the microphones to ask your questions. And we're going to invite all of the slammers back up here one more time as well to take questions.
Okay, yes. Hi, this is for Dr. Yankowitz. You stack them and you twist them, they have different properties. What are some examples of the, some of the things that you've observed? Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, do you want me to repeat that? Uh, in other words, what, what kinds of properties, what, what happens? That would be helpful, wouldn't it? Can you make a better insulator? Yeah, I, so uh, these materials are incredible because you have complete access to the entire material. The entire material is the surface. So we have the ability to, as I said, you know, make the interfaces that we want and tune new properties. So the types of properties we can see, for example, are taking materials like graphene, which are normally metals, and turning them into superconductors. We can turn them into magnets. We can turn them into materials that have even more exotic properties called topological insulators. So these types of materials are insulators in the bulk of the material, but they conduct electricity just along the boundary. And we can use these types of things, for example, for a completely uh, resistanceless or dissipationless uh, electron transport where we push current through the device and the electrons don't scatter at all, so there's no energy loss due to heat. And we can also use these devices for uh, some type of quantum mechanical information processing. So there's hope, for example, for using these devices to, to make a quantum computer. Um, so, you know, the answer I could go on for an hour about all sorts of properties that we could see in these materials because there's just such a vast array of them and there's so many combinations that we can make. How big are the che sheets? Are they, or are they? Uh, how big are the materials themselves? Yeah, when you make a sheet, how, how big is it? So they're typically a few so micrometers, a okay. and that's a fraction of the width of a human hair. So you can imagine these things are difficult to pick up and, and make a sandwich out of. <laughs> but we've developed some very fine controls for how to do this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to switch to question on the right. Uh, my question is for the organizers. What are the voting criteria? <laughs> Literally whatever you want. <laughs> Excellent question. Hi, uh, I have a question for Dr. Wong. Um, so you stated that the uh, organisms on Jupiter, uh, they, they consume ammonia, that's what gives them their energy. So, but you also stated that Jupiter has a very limited supply of an ammonia. So what happens if those organisms consume all the ammonia? Do they just go extinct or that can they evolve to, um, or could they evolve to uh, have a different consumption source? That's a fantastic question. Thank you for asking me that. You get a sticker. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jupiter's moon Europa. Um, yes, so the question is, if you consume all of your energy source, do you run out and then do you go extinct? And that's an excellent question because all organisms consume something, produced waste products, and if there's nothing regenerating the source of energy that they need, then they will die out. But something that we've learned through observing our own biosphere is that no organism exists in isolation. We're all dependent on each other. We depend on the trees, for instance, for oxygen. And so um, these organisms that would essentially be the primary producers on, on Jupiter, remember the hypothetical organisms in Jupiter using sunlight uh, as part of their energy source, will probably need to rely on some other consortium of, of organisms to regenerate the things that they use. Or they could rely on um, some, some abiotic process. Um, so planets themselves have, have ways of, of recycling material here on Earth. Um, plate tectonics is one way of doing that, of dredging up new material for the biosphere from the interior of our world. Jupiter also has convection, not plate tectonics, because it doesn't really have rocks, but uh, convective storms can also dredge things up, new material from the bottom of, uh, of Jupiter's atmosphere. Uh, and, so, and so there are a lot of possibilities, uh, and uh, I hope that somebody solves them. Maybe, maybe you will. You'll design that probe that will go to Jupiter and figure out if those organisms are really there and what's feeding them for the long term. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so my question is related. Uh, this is for you, Dr. Wong. But you had mentioned that we would expect to find more ammonia than we're actually seeing. And I was just curious as to why we would have that expectation. Another great question and deserving of another sticker. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. So 
Right, so we're, we're, we're exploring Jupiter with this, um, this probe called the Juno spacecraft. It's in orbit of Jupiter, and it's got a microwave radiometer. So it's sensitive to the, the things that absorb and emit in the microwave wavelengths, and ammonia is one of them. And so what this, this spacecraft has found is that um, in the deeper part of Jupiter's atmosphere, there is a certain amount of ammonia, and we know that this, this, you know, this is a great question. This ties back into the, into the other one perfectly. That there is, we know that there's convection happening in Jupiter's atmosphere as well. And so that ammonia, we think, should be well mixed because of convective mixing in Jupiter's atmosphere. It's just so fast that the ammonia should be a constant uh, um, a mixing ratio or concentration throughout the entire upper part of Jupiter's atmosphere until it condenses into the ammonium clouds at the top. But it's not constant. It goes down something seems to be consuming it. We don't know what, um, but maybe you will find out. <laughs> so thank you. thank you. My question's for Dr. Bartram, even though I don't see any stickers in front of her. Um, <laughs> I, uh, years ago, uh, uh, read something that said the Average temperature of the universe was about uh, 3.5 degrees Kelvin, and then a little more recently I've heard it was, well, okay, maybe it's 3 or 3.5, and now tonight I'm learning it's 2 degrees. So what's going on there? <laughs> um, well, I'm actually not an astronomer, but I can tell you that <laughs> the... Do you want to answer? <laughs> well, my best guess is that, you know, there's been uh, better measurements of the cosmic microwave background recently, but I don't know if that responds. Do you have t uh, stickers? Okay. <laughs> Tragically, I only have ball pit balls. <laughs> Although I have plenty if you have a favorite color. Uh, we're trying to get them out of our house. Uh, so what's happening, as uh, Chelsea alluded to, so really, these days, if you, if you convert the CMB into a temperature, it's about 2.7 degrees Kelvin, or 2.7 Kelvin. So it, it is not, you know, totally, totally off track. Uh, but we've been improving over time all of the different ways that we can constrain the cosmolo mo cosmological constants that make that measurement. And in fact, most recently, the Planck satellite gave us this measurement that we think has the best measurement. We do know, actually, there is some variation in the cosmic microwave background. It's not all the same temperature. That tells us something about why we end up with these structures of chunky galaxies and empty space and what's going on there. Uh, we also know, actually, there is currently a little bit of a science fight going on because some of those measurements from Planck don't line up with the other cosmological constants we measure locally. So that number is going to keep on changing a little bit. We, you know, it moves around. We measure stuff. We see what's going on. We measure it again. Uh, you can observe any of you. Some people will in this audience will be like, why would you mention such a thing? You can observe the CMB in your home if you have held on to your tube televisions. So probably only a small, small fraction of you, but it, about 1% of the static that you see on an old-fashioned tube television, for the young people, those are televisions that are not flat, uh, <laughs> is, <laughs> is the CMB. And so you can actually measure the earliest light that we can observe, however not to the precision that will differentiate between 3.5 and 2.7 Kelvin. So Thank you both. My question is to Dr. Mitra. Uh, the question is, uh, how can we, using the camera you presented to us, uh, measure the uh, dark matter, something we can't imagine what it is exactly? Should we put this camera on Earth, on Cosmos? How all this like measuring pipeline works? Thank you for that question. Um, so I also don't have stickers, <laughs> so apologies. <laughs> So dark matter is actually like um, all around us. Um, so what, uh, what we have done is, uh, you know, light bends around heavy gravitational objects. We have used this to make maps of the sky where it is, and it turns out that it's all over the galaxy and beyond the galaxy. In fact, we are actually passing through it. So if you build a detector here on Earth, uh, dark, ma uh, like, uh, dark matter is really passing through the detector. So, so we place these detectors actually deep underground in mines, uh, that is to shield it from the background radiation that comes from the sky. 
um, so that we have the best chance of detecting dark matter. Um, and how uh, we hope dark matter will interact is, uh, is kind of like uh, if you imagine playing pool, dark matter comes in and hits one of the silicon atoms or electrons and we detect that uh, recoil. Now it is totally possible that dark matter may never do that and we might never detect it. Um, that'll be sad. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean we won't try. So prior to our next question, uh, we, for the sake of time and getting you all home on time, we're going to keep audience questions where they're at right now. So let's finish these questions, and then we'll go to voting. Mm -hmm. um, so another question for Dr. Wong. Uh, I was wondering what kind of observations would be needed to determine whether the lack of ammonia and other things that you're mentioning were to, due to biological or non-biological processes? Love it. Yes. Excellent. You get a sticker, too. <laughs> All right. So what kind of observations do we need? Well, I think we need to go there. Planetary science and astrobiology, they're built on missions. Right? There are so many discoveries that, that we have made by going up close and personal to planetary bodies. And I don't mean this as a disrespect to any of my colleagues who use telescopes from the ground. They do amazing work as well. <laughs> <laughs> but there are just some things that we could never know about a body unless we're right there. Um, and so the stickers that I've been giving out, for instance, Europa, Europa is a moon of Jupiter. We know, we, we know it as a subsurface ocean of liquid water and is therefore maybe one of the best places to look for life only because we had a probe that measured the oscillating magnetic fields that was induced in, in, in Europa's ocean thanks to Jupiter. So I think to answer that question, to, to figure out what is actually in Jupiter's atmosphere, we need to go there. We need to send a probe that essentially drops into that region of Jupiter's atmosphere, samples material from it, and analyzes it in, in, in chemical space, in mass space, and in complexity space to understand if that is living material. Thank you. We're, we are going to Titan. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, so there is uh, an amazing mission called Dragonfly. If you haven't heard of it, look it up. It's so amazing. It's an octocopter that will literally fly in Titan's atmosphere and sample myriad places on its surface for chemical complexity and perhaps indications that life could have emerged on that, uh, on that moon of Saturn's surface. Uh, Titan's one of my favorite places in the solar system. I could spend hours talking about it, but I think I'll let uh, us go to the next question. So, Dr. Mitra, this is back to you. You know, if you're you're in that cave, or you know, looking at the like searching for dark matter particles, um, I'm just curious. You know, you showed us that big picture, and, and you zoomed in, and you got this clarity, and we still just saw these blips. So, I'm curious of uh, w w how would you recognize that it was dark matter if you find it, and also what would you hope to find, and and how would you use that information? Um, so. Uh, so like you said, um, uh, so when particles interact uh, with the silicon atoms uh, in the CCD, they will deposit some amount of energy, and we can uh, detect the amount of energy that was deposited. Um, sometimes using this, we can actually determine what kind of particles it was. So dark matter should look like nuclear recoils, which are exactly, which look pretty much the same as neutrons. So at that point, what happens is you try to shield it from as much, uh, as much background as possible. Um, and you can't shield against everything, so you'll have to now run simulations to see how much background you expect. And then if you get a signal, the signal will look like uh, an excess uh, from what you expected. So the analysis at that point becomes statistical. Well, since we can see single electrons, um, calibration is a thing of the past. <laughs> Not really. I mean, you can just see like the little peaks with single electrons. You can say, OK, one electron deposits this much amount of energy. Nothing here. Here's another. So, But, but we do calibrate it with like uh, radioactive sources as well as a cross-check. Thank you. All right, I was tempted to ask Dr. Wong a question just for a sticker, but... <laughs> They're all gone, man. <laughs> uh, my question's for Dr. Yankowitz. Um, basically, it's on the uh, what we can expect coming out of uh, 2D materials. 
Um, does it mean my iPhone's going to get thinner and actually get all-day battery life? Like, what do you think are the end user implications? Well, the, the great thing about science is that we don't know. And that really, you know, <laughs> if I knew, I would start a company. Uh, but <laughs> I can tell you some ideas for what might be useful. Uh, so the good thing about these two-dimensional materials is that they're very flexible. Right? It's just one sheet of atoms, so you can bend them. And graphene, for instance, only absorbs about 2% of incident light. So you can imagine using it as a very flexible and very energy efficient touch screen for your phone. And if you can make all the other components of your phone out of these two-dimensional materials as well, then you could have a flexible phone. So you could roll it up like a pencil and store it in your pocket. You could sew it into your shirt. So there's a lot of applications like this. There's a lot of applications potentially in, in solar cells that perform better than materials that we know of today. And there's a whole other class of applications in, in quantum computing which is essentially trying to beat the types of calculations that classical computers can do with the standard transistors that have like a one or a zero for current flowing or not flowing. We want to use all the information in between. And quantum mechanics allows us to, allows us to do that, and these materials might be a viable path for, for realizing those types of devices. So, and then there's even more exotic applications. They're mechanically rigid, so people have used them to reinforce like tennis racket handles. Uh, you know, the, the sky's the limit on these things. but. Materials development takes a long time, and we're still in the fundamental research side of this, or at least that's what, what I'm doing. There's a lot of people working on you know, how to drive these things to market. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my question is for Dr. Sun. Um, your research involves um, constraining the upper bound on the mass of the neutrino. Is there research that's uh, working on trying to find a lower bound? Um, so, the lower bound, um, so if we, there, the, there are That's multiple. definitely above zero? Is, you know, is there research that could prove that it's definitely above zero? Uh, it, it's difficult to do so, um, but you can actually measure the neutrino mass in multiple ways. Another way is to, uh, in the cosmology uh, physics. So they look at the, um, the stuff in our universe, and they can calculate a average mass of the neutrinos. And I think their result is something around 200 MeV, and that's also the sensitivity we are targeting at. So yeah, there, there's an um, average lower bound of, of the neutrino mass. Thank you. My question is to Mr. Wang again. Hope there are more speakers. Um, um, well, in your speech, you mentioned that there is assumption uh, on Jupiter the same physical law must be applied as we have on Earth. Uh, so can you explain why? That's a great question. I wish I had a sticker to give you. <laughs> oh, no, never mind, never mind. Oh, gone. sorry. Uh, but, but yeah, nonetheless, uh, an amazing question. The same physical laws uh, apply throughout the universe, we suspect. The same laws of chemistry as well. Uh, we see by examining places like Mars and moons like Enceladus that the same laws of geology also arise. Um, these same processes make us ask the question, is biology a resultant of these same laws as well. Can, can biology essentially emerge uh, as a physical process out of the same laws that govern everything else in the universe? Are, are, are the laws of biology also universal? That's, that's a question, not an answer. Um, but nonetheless, we suspect that the physics that drives life here on Earth, especially that electron transfer that I spoke of, that you are all doing, um, you know, 10 to the 20 something times per second passing electrons through your mitochondria to make ATP. Um, that is probably going to be some kind of universal for life as well, that, that life will operate if it's in a, if life is in an organometallic aqueous construct that emerges on a world, uh, th that electron transfer that dissipation of a redox gradient, if you want to get technical, uh, will probably apply. And so we can look for those scenarios on other worlds or ways to create them using light. And, and, and again, it's a testable hypothesis that we can go to these worlds and see if that's really the case. Um, as you said, because it's because biology. So I wonder, is that possible? Because our human beings' existence, um, because the existence of our human being on Earth, 
the physical law on Earth is decided by our existence, but on Jupiter or on Mars, um, like different existence of biology might like result in different physical laws. I think that's a very interesting question. I think the way we would approach this is to, to understand that the laws of physics will remain the same no matter what planet you're on. But the specific scenarios of what chemicals are available, the amount of light and what wavelength that light is at could vary. And you're absolutely right that our existence is completely dependent on the history of life on this world. The fact that we breathe oxygen is dependent on um, the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis billions of years ago. And so the, that specific chemical scenario will be different, but the laws that govern how oxygen behaves or how any other element behaves and what it can do for life will be the same on any planet. Hope that makes sense. Okay, thank you. I think your answer is much more important, Dickers. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, let's thank our slammers one more time. Absolutely. And thank you all the audience members who asked wonderful questions. Now it is time to decide on a slammer supreme. So please vote. Head to this voting address, poll.fm slash numbers, and you can cast your vote for whoever was your favorite slammer. We'll give you three minutes. You will know when time is running out. My girlfriend is a grad student at U Chicago in the Park Lab, uh, doing very similar sort of 2D materials. She says she's a big fan of your work. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I was going to tell, tell you that. Yeah. That department has been like, famously uh, in this case, uh, whatever. They, like, some of the big guys there are like, they don't like the experience. Mm, really? It's good to just take it as a moment. Yeah. My postdoc advisor just gave me a talk there. Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Just in the oven. Yeah, it's cool stuff. She gave me a tour of her lab when I visited. Uh, she's working on MOS2 uh, and thermal properties of that. Um, probably can't go into more detail than that, unfortunately. But yeah, it's, it's cool stuff. So when do you think you're going to lose them? Well, so, you know, I'll just pretend it's going to be. I want to know why. No, actually, we met at Caltech. Okay. Yeah, so I've been doing long distance in a while. <laughs> but you didn't push up, yeah. How long have you been playing the flute? Uh, well, I played it in high school and then after the first time, I started, well, throughout the 
Okay, we have a winner. But first, we want to officially recognize that you were all excellent slammers. <laughs> with these certificates, with these certificates. And you can put them up on your fridge with these string theory magnets. Says uh, my cat has strong feelings about string theory. <laughs> they can see. <laughs> I can't. I can't see. <laughs> we can't see here. All right, and the winner, taking home the title of Slammer Supreme, is Dr. Mike Wong. Please accept. Please accept our prize of a Mary Curie glow-in-the-dark tote bag and our gift card to Cafe Solstice. Let's thank all of our slammers one more time. And thank all of you for coming. <laughs> we hope to see you next year.